I hear you say good morning. Um, I have just the one announcement today to draw your attention to. First Garva will be supporting the Blytheswood Shoebox Appeal this year 
and the need is ever greater than before. A box will be in the vestibule over the next few weeks to collect items. Cash donations may be left in the offering plates or the black letter box at the back door of the church. Essential items are toothpaste and toothbrush, small toys for boys and girls, hat, scarf, gloves, soap, sweets, best before no earlier than the 31st of March 21, and for the first time, underwear. Items for adults are also needed, such as sewing, equip sewing equipment, stationary toiletries, candles, tools, kitchen utensils, and clothing such as pyjamas and t-shirts. All items must be new. And uh, you will find this leaflet and all the information on it. And we're now going to watch a video about that. Thank you. All around the world, there are families who are not as lucky as we are. They don't live in big houses, and many have to go without electricity and running water. Christmas time can be hard for them, as they often can't afford to buy presents for their children or relatives. Jimbolia is one of many towns in Romania where we at Blytheswood Care try to do what we can to help. We've made many great friends there and help where we can with their problems. We've set up after-school activities at the Talita Coombe Centre, where the local children get to play games and learn and get a nice warm meal. We love to try and give those local families a merrier Christmas by providing presents to those that can't afford it themselves. But to do this, we need your help. We're asking you to help by filling an empty shoebox with useful bits and bobs that they might not have. We're looking for toiletries like soap, toothbrushes and shampoo, stationery like pens, pencils and colouring books, Useful household items like candles, tools and kitchen utensils. Clothes like scarves and gloves. And toys for girls and boys. Remember, we're providing gifts for the whole family and all age ranges. Once you've filled your shoebox, just deliver it to your local collection point and we'll make sure it makes its way to the people who need it most. We meet in strange times. It's strange looking down the congregation and you with your faces covered. The Reverend Mark today is in Articlave and I'm here in Garda and it's, I'm glad to be back and uh, trying to get back to a new kind of normality. As we gather to worship God, Almighty God, we hear some words from the prophecy of Isaiah and then some words in the book of Hebrews. Isaiah says, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder, the wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And that's what we've come to do in worship today, to earnestly seek him. Let us pray. <clears throat> Creator God, saviour and sustainer, teacher and friend, just as potters mould and shape their creations, so you have promised not to leave us, but to change us so that your image is recreated in us. We praise you for the power you give to change, reform and renew not only our lives, but the lives of others. Loving Father, you shape our lives and allow us to dream. In worship today, give us such a vision of you that our minds will not be bound always by conformity, but will be filled with hope for change in lives which to us now seems impossible. You know us through and through. We say that 
we follow you, but often go our own selfish ways. We have hurt others through our speech, our attitudes, and even our actions, and lack of action. And we turn to you again, seeking your mercy. Give us grace to know your touch through Christ, and surprise us as we see new life flourish in a variety of ways, and keep crafting in us ways in which we can forgive ourselves as well as others. We come to you through Jesus Christ, who died that we might be forgiven, who died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. We adore you, we seek your forgiveness, we seek your help in the words that you, our Savior, have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we stand to sing from the metrical psalm number 84, How Lovely is Thy Dwelling Place.
Now, Linda Little is going to read the first lesson. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at the end, and then some verses into chapter 2. And it's really on those verses at the end of that reading that I want us to meditate on later in the service. Linda, thank you. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Amen. Thank you, Linda. Now, yes, boys and girls, I see one or two of you about this morning, uh, and I see Mark has very kindly left this little thing up in the pulpit for me. Isn't that lovely? Now, you're going to be deeply disappointed this morning because I'm not into these wonderful children's talks that the Reverend Mark has been doing with you during the lockdown. I have been intrigued as I've logged in uh, sometimes later on a Sunday, and watch these wonderful children's addresses. Well, today I'm going to keep up the theme of looking at nature, and you can get a clue what it's going to be about. And I'll tell you how it came about. About two weeks ago, I was reading the morning paper, and I read this article, and it was about this thing. The false cacao moth the false cacao, a cacao moth. Have you ever seen one? Have you? You have. Well, then Garva must be very, very famous because this is a new species of moth. And by the way, the man who discovered it was on the radio yesterday morning in your place and mine, if any of you heard him. He's, he's a man called Andrew Crory, and he is a moth recorder, and he is an expert moth trapper, and he was down in County Down at, at, um, uh, at the uh, Murloch Nature Reserve, where he discovered the very first sighting of the false cacao moth in Ireland. So if you've seen one in Garva, then Garva's very famous as well. Uh, and this is a new species of butterfly or moth. Now, I haven't gone into the biology or the botany of this uh, or whatever, um, but I'm told that a moth and a butterfly are sort of the same thing. But some of you might correct me afterwards about that. But every summer... This man called Andrew Crory sees many hundreds of moths and over 100 species. And that means over 100 family of moths, different families, over 100 types of moths. And he, and he records, he, he writes down, makes a record of every one of the species and numbers them. And he says that this has led to quite a number of headaches and they're tricky to identify. 
Do you know how many different types of moths he has seen down in County Down? Would you like to guess? Anybody like to guess? He has seen 793 types, types, kinds, and many, many thousands of, of, of moths, but 793 different types have been seen at Murloc, coming from so southern Europe, coming from the tropics, and, now what do you think of this one? Yes, we have another one coming up somewhere. Yet, yeah. no, this isn't the one I was looking for. Have you got Stephen's gem? There we are. Stephen's gem. Have you seen that one in Garva? Huh? Because he, he saw Stephen's gem in 2012 down at Murloch. And Stephen's gem was blown across the Atlantic by Hurricane Sandy in 2012 from the United States. And still, it's the only time that it's been recorded in Murloch. But I guarantee this is the one that you've seen in Garva. Have we got it on the screen? The brown house moth. That's the one that whenever you go in, oh, I, I'm sure you don't go into a drawer in Garva and find this, or whenever you go into the corner of a window or maybe on the curtain and you go to chase it away and it leaves all sorts of dusty brown stuff in your fingers. Did you ever see the brown house moth? I think you have. I think you probably have because it's the most common moth in Ireland. Now, whenever I thought about all these wee things that we take for granted, we just take for granted that when we go out into the garden on a sunny day, we'll see a, a beautiful butterfly and we see the moths around us and so on and so forth and we never think another thing about it. And yet, there are so many of them People study them, and they are creatures that God has given us, and God cares for them. They can fly across the Atlantic, or they come on a ship, or some way they get across into Ireland. They come from southern Europe. They come from the tropics up into Ireland. Amazing. And it got me thinking, here we are, who know so much about God because he has given us his word, and especially in the last couple or three weeks as we've gone back to school and things are different and, and, and sometimes maybe we're afraid. Well, boys and girls, I want to leave this verse with you today, and I have to read this verse to me myself many times. Because Jesus is trying to tell people not to be afraid that God is there and we can trust him and follow him. And he says, not one sparrow. Now, he could equally well have said, not one moth is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Let me read that verse again. Not one sparrow is forgotten by God. Not one little boy or girl in Garva is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Amen. Now, we're going to stand again and sing, If I Were a Moth. No, it sounds better if we sing, If I Were a Butterfly. Let's stand.
Now let's come in prayer again as we thank God for so much and as we remember the needs of others. Let us pray. And with the hymn writer, we say, Praise my soul, the King of heaven. To thy feet our tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. We thank you for the many people whom you bring into our lives to enrich them and to bring comfort and encouragement. We thank you especially for the faith that you give us by your Spirit that saving faith in Jesus Christ. Give us truly grateful hearts for, for providing the opportunity for us to be back in our meeting house. And we pray for so many that we do not know by name, but you know them. The medical scientists who are exercised daily in research for a vaccine for C-19. Encourage them in their endeavors and give them courage. Give courage to those who volunteer in the various drug trials. Lift up those who are afraid, and especially we think of those who cannot be near loved ones in isolation. Give endurance. Give endurance to doctors and nurses and all the support staff in our hospitals and in the community. Give increasing confidence to teachers and pupils and students as this new academic year pro progresses with so many changes and limitations. Bring comfort to families where a loved one has been taken or where a member has had to relocate. And we pray especially for those who will relocate for study or work. Come, gracious Holy Spirit, clear away the cobwebs of complex memories and tangled thoughts and even the messy motives and help us in your power to flourish, living out your love in our daily lives. Challenge us afresh in this new season of work and witness in this place to create places of welcome, indeed a church without walls, offering your love and care and compassion to those who need it most. And help the minister and leaders and people of this congregation to be courageous, being a witness to you and your saving purposes for humanity. And we pray all this for the glory of your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I just want to read a few verses from the 10th chapter of John in that passage where um, <clears throat> Jesus speaks about the shepherd and his flock. And down at verse 27, Jesus says this, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Let us again pray. Our Master, thank you for putting us on the disciple pathway. The lifelong journey of learning about you and with you. You go ahead of us as our shepherd, drawing us onwards to appreciate what we can be, yet freeing us to learn to live within our earthly limitations. 
Come now as we meditate on your word and teach us afresh through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Briefly this morning, I want to speak about the basis of your faith, the basis of my faith. And if you learn nothing this morning, I hope that you will go away asking yourself, what is the basis of my faith? I want to tell you a story. A story about, and this is a story I'm sure maybe you've heard already because I think it's been written in, in very many places, a story that's been told often, but I think it's worth telling again. And the story is told of a new husband who watched curiously as his bride prepared a place, uh, prepared to place a ham in the oven. <clears throat> and before putting it in to cook, she took a knife and carefully trimmed off both ends of the ham. And the husband said to her, why do you cut off both ends of the ham before cooking it? And the young wife says, well, you know, I don't really know. I never cooked a ham before, but that's the way my mother always did it. And her curiosity was aroused, and so she telephoned her mother, and she asked her mother why she'd always cut off both ends of a ham before she cooked it. And the mother says, now that you come to mention that, I don't know, dear, that's just the way your grandmother always did it. Other than that, I honestly don't have a clue. Determined now to unravel this mystery, the young bride then telephoned her grandmother and asked her why she always cut off both ends of the ham before she cooked it. And the grandmother says, Well, sweetheart, the first oven I had wasn't big enough to put the whole ham into. So I had to cut the ends off it to make it fit. After that, I guess, it just became a habit. And so in these verses at the end of 1 Corinthians, at the, end, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 2, Paul says to you, when I came to you, I didn't come with wonderful eloquence to you here in this great city of Corinth. I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So if I were to ask you this morning, what is the basis of your faith? You might say, like that young lady cooking the ham, well, it's tradition, isn't it? I was born into a Christian family, and what a great privilege that is. I was reared up in the church as a covenant child and given a framework to build within. I believe in God because that's the tradition I've been born into. And I wonder this morning, as I challenge myself, as I hope you will, what if I had been born into a Muslim family? Or indeed, the Jews might argue that it was tradition that helped them keep their identity. But of course, tradition has its severe limitations. It has many good things, but it has many limitations. The Apostle Paul, as he thought of the tradition that he'd been reared in, and he had been reared in a very strong tradition, a very proud tradition that had helped him in many, many ways to become the great evangelist of Europe that he was. 
But when he was writing to the church in Philippi, chapter 3, verses 4b to 6, and I'm reading from the message, he says to them, you know my pedigree. That's really what he says. Have we got those verses? You know my pedigree. And here he presents a long list of the tradition in which he was reared. But he says, the very credentials these people are waving around is something special. I'm now tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yet, while all these things may be important, our traditions, there's a limitation to them. And I'm now throwing them all out. Why? Because of Christ. And sometimes we maybe say, well, I base my faith on my study of the Bible and my intellect, how I come to learn. And of course, some of us and many of you, maybe all of you have had the great privilege of learning Bible verses from you could speak and understand. And people do come to God by this route. They look at the wonder and the majesty of creation, and they say they must be a creator. They ponder the mystery of self-giving love and conclude that a mechanical universe could not have produced something so far superior to itself. So that the Christian faith is indeed a reasonable faith. The great scientist Edward Thomas Sinton. <clears throat> I think we have a picture of him. Edward Thomas Sinton, who was born away down in this, I think it was Waterford or Wexford, where his father was a Methodist minister. And in the providence of God, that Methodist minister came to Cookstown. And Ernest Walton started off his secondary education in the school, indeed, where our three boys attended. Ernest Walton eventually in 1951 obtained the uh, Nobel Prize for Physics because he was involved in the splitting of the atom. And this is what he once said, one way to learn the mind of the creator is to study his creation. But you know, as we think of reason, as we think of intellect, are miracles reasonable? Can we understand them? I can't. Can we understand prayer? It's beyond our intellect. We, we know Jesus tells us to pray, but we just don't understand it. What about the resurrection? Can we, can we grasp that in our mind? It is way beyond our, our understanding. And yet we accept it by faith. Suffering, intellect won't help us there. Now, of course, intellect and reason are helpful in our faith, but they have their limits. And you might say, and indeed you might be sitting there today thinking, well, you know, I don't have the faith that I, that I see other people having because I haven't had that experience. I haven't had that emotion. And of course, feelings are as essential to faith as reason or tradition. Of course, they're involved there. Paul had that emotional experience on the road to Damascus, and he also had a superior intellect and he worked hard at maintaining the traditions. But none of these were enough. So what was enough? On what was Paul's faith based? Well, in, in those verses that we, that, he read, that we read, he says, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. In other words, Paul's faith was built not on emotion, intellect, or tradition, 
but on his experience, if you like, of Christ's power in his daily life, the presence of Christ with him. Tradition was important in his religious development. Reason was important. All the, all the learning mechanisms that he had learned at the foot of the great, the great Jewish teacher, uh, and so on and so forth. And, of course, he never forgot that emotional experience in the Damascus Road. It was life-changing. But, of course, he knew that everybody couldn't have an experience like that. But the overwhelming foundation of his faith was his daily sense of Christ's presence. Now, of course, as you think about your faith this morning, of course, your faith may have once been based, you, you may have once have had your parents' faith, if you like, or st it may have started out as an intellectual quest or affirmation, or indeed, it may have been that you were caught up in some emotional experience. But what of today? Is, it, is today, is it based upon a daily walk in his presence and in his power? We know today that it is real in our lives, not because of what we've been told or what we have deduced or because of what we have felt once upon a time, but because Jesus Christ is as much a part of our lives as breathing or eating. One night, a fire broke out in a house, and a young boy was forced to flee to the roof. And the father stood on the ground below with outstretched arms, calling to his son, Jump! I'll catch you! He knew the boy had to jump to save his life, and all the boy could see, however, was flame and smoke and darkness and blackness. And as can be imagined, he was afraid to leave the roof. His father kept yelling, jump, I'll catch you. But the boy protested to his father, daddy, I can't see you. And the father replied, but I see you, and that's all that matters. I see you, and that's all that matters. And I don't know about you and how you struggle in these days of strange things happening. And I don't know about your faith. And it may be that today you're saying, but Father, I can't see I can't see through all this. I can't see through all this teaching and all that I've heard in my life from tradition or emotion or all these other things. But God says, I see you. And that's all that matters. Just put your trust in me. And I will never leave you or forsake you. That wonderful hymn, Safe in the Arms of Jesus. Because those outstretched arms on the cross is the only hope that you and I, sinners that we are, that's the only hope that we have. Because we're told in the third chapter of Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you and I may have had many influences, many privileges and advantages. They may be all ours. Or indeed, we could have many hardships or disadvantages or difficulties. They may strew your path today. But the, path, the message today is this. Let not your faith rest alone on human wisdom, but on God's power. As Paul writing to the church in, Philipp, in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, be filled with the Spirit the condition in which you and I are to live daily opening of our lives to him, trusting him for power to live the life that he wants us to live. May God bless you and me 
as we think on these things. Let us pray. Father God, as we come before you today, we know that often we have many, many questions. And we don't seem sometimes to get many answers. But we continue to search in your word. We thank you for the fellowship of those who travel on the road with us. And we pray today that you will help us to hear you say to us, don't worry, I can see you, and that's all that matters. Just trust me. Amen. Well, we stand as we sing again a wonderful hymn of affirmation, All My Hope on God is Founded. God is endless and ageless. Go now and delve deeper into his mystery as the journey stretches out before you. And the peace of God, which is beyond our understanding, guard and keep you in the knowledge of him and of his Son, Jesus Christ, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you all evermore. Amen. Now resume your seats and the stewards will tell you how to leave. Thank you. And I'll wait in the pulpit until you're all out. <clears throat>
I'm not sure. 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 I'